Vincent Lloyd. I teach at, at Villanova in the Philadelphia area. I think about religion and politics. And um, yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I, I try to think with both people coming from the theological direction and ecclesial communities, but also from a sort of secular academic and humanities direction. Yeah, do you identify yourself or situate yourself with any particular religious discourse at all, or? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I try to be comfortable speaking in both uh, both spaces, and I've been around Episcopal communities um, in the last few years. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, let me read that quote real quick. It's, it's on, I think it's in the, um, so it's from your book, The Problem with Grace, Reconfiguring Political Theology from, I think, 2011 is when it came out. Mm-hmm. And let me see if I can find that quote. I know it's... I think it's not the appendix, I think it's the, in the, the quote to the conclusion. Mm-hmm. So it's, a, it's the first paragraph in the conclusion, so it's kind of lengthy as a quote. Do you mind if I read it? Sure. Okay, cool. So I just found this really interesting because uh, as I was finishing this book up last night, I came across this quote and it just sounds, it's from the conclusion which is titled Politics of the Middle. There are two kinds of politics. On the one hand, the politics of law and grace. On the other hand, the politics of the middle. Buttressed by the virtues of love and faith, employing the strategies of tradition, liturgy, sanctity, revelation, and prophecy, a politics of the middle toils in the ordinary. It does not wallow in the ordinary, nor does it vegetate in the ordinary, although these are powerful temptations. Refusing a politics that would claim authority from beyond the world or from the beyond located within, a politics of the ordinary is tempted to content itself with this refusal. The ordinary can saturate, it can offer a feeling of completion. There is no need for the big words of theorists when everything one needs and needs to know is right here, present in the everyday conduct of life. Here, right here, we have joys and pains, sorrows and triumphs, and the wisdom to make sense of them all. It is familiar, reassuring, beautiful. Why bother with politics at all? So I just found that really fascinating because um, throughout the book, you're, you're dealing with this idea of law and grace and supersessionism within political theology and particularly within it seems to me like a, a Christian supersessionism of Judaism. Yeah, I, I'm worried about supersessionism both as a specific historical phenomenon about how Christians think about Jews, but also as a, a kind of cultural logic, right? A, a way that people imagine um, uh, themselves and their people and their ideas as different from others and, uh, uh, that follows a sort of pattern of um, those others, those people who came before, those less enlightened people being committed to something like law, something like a caricature of Judaism, and just you know following uh, the rules, doing what uh, they're supposed to do, um, without um, uh, feeling, without loving, uh, without uh, a kind of uh, redemption that comes about by getting things right, right? Uh, whereas we. <laughs> Uh, how, know how to get things right. We know how to you know, fit everything uh, together in, in the right way. Uh, we know how to be saved. Um, and that uh, opposition you know, makes us uh, feel good, right? Us who are you know, in the, on the grace side of things. Um, uh, and it, it seems like a real challenge for Christians uh, and for everyone, right? To figure out how to uh, both um, uh, be committed to some vision of redemption, but also um, uh, have a distance from that vision of redemption and have a sense of you know, fallenness and sin uh, that goes really deep. Um, so, I mean, th- th- that's on the sort of grand scale of things, uh, sort of this historical phenomenon of supersessionism connected with a sort of um, habit of thought which goes wrong. But it more uh, sort of specifically, uh, um, Right. I, I worry that, you know, um, people talking about political theology uh, in all the different ways that that's used um, focus uh, too much on um, uh, offering uh, a vision of how uh, politics informed by religion and particularly Christianity can save the world, right? can get everything right, right? Can, can make everything fit together. Um, and the antidote to that uh, is to uh, reflect on politics at a very small scale, um, and uh, which is a sort of a poli- politics right, in the broad sense that we encounter in our ordinary lives, where things are messy and complex, and we always realize that you know there's no you know just by living you know with our families, with our uh, loved ones, with our communities, with the, the 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 places in which we we find ourselves, we realize there's no uh, 
uh, uh, vision that will make everything right. Um, so I, I want to encourage us to sort of reflect on, on those small scale um, experiences in order to inform how we think about the, the big questions, both of Christian theology and of politics. That's interesting. Um, it seems to me that political theology on the left is used more as a critique of sovereignty or a, a, like a nation state politics. I'm thinking of the, particularly of the work of Jeffrey Robbins. He wrote a book a couple years back on political theology and democ and basically radical democracy. I think something along those lines where you want to argue for a more inclusive democracy. And I'm wondering like the politics of the middle would be a, a great rebuttal to this kind of like nation state or, or the, the sovereign as a one or the sovereign as a, as a one body or institution um, critique because the politics of the middle would be something where it could overlap a lot with or even kind of be situated within a radical democracy too because democracy is the politics of the middle for, from my understanding where it's messy it's it's ordinary it's everyday you know they're from mischaracterizations of like oh well uh, democratic socialism or a democracy will have just meetings all the time and we'll have to decide on who gets this amount of water and so on and so forth and who gets allocated this land and this housing and stuff like that but it, but to me, like your idea of messiness is important. So I'm wondering if maybe like your critique of the supersessionism would, how would that kind of co configure itself within like contemporary pol political machinations? So right, I, 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 as, as you're saying, I, I'm sympathetic to um, critiques of sovereignty from a radical democratic uh, perspective, but I also wonder you know, if there really are people who hold such a, an enchanted view of sovereignty, right, as the radical democratic critics sometimes make it out to be, where do you run into these people uh, who, uh, you know, um, think that the sovereign, sovereign is monolith, monolithic and, you know, um, all powerful and, or, or desire that, or, or, you know, where it's, you know, part of the political vocabulary. Uh, Stanley Hauerwas and uh, Jeffrey Stout sometimes argue uh, about whether Howard Wass's church or uh, Stout's democracy is more of a fiction, right? I mean, they're both sort of ideals uh, that the, the two hold up. Um, uh, and so, I mean, uh, both of those uh, categories don't, um, I mean, it seem like they can be enchanting uh, and uh, distracting and supersessionist in this sense, right? That um, you know, everything that uh, people have been doing before and that political theorists have been talking about isn't really democracy, it's just been you know, um, what uh, the unenlightened people uh, do in their politics, if it's realistic or if it's, you know, theological or, or whatever. But now that we have this idea of democracy, you know, we can see how all those other things were sort of leading up to it. And democracy is a realization, you know, democracy properly understood as I or we understand it is a, the proper realization. Of it, right? I mean, it seems like just as problematic as, you know, certain versions of church that are um, doing analogous things. Right? So, I mean, I, I do think, um, uh, as Jeff Stout's more recent work and Stanley Hauerwas's more recent work has um, been uh, pointing us toward, you know, uh, thinking about community organizing and small scale um, struggles against domination uh, can be really in, not only inspiring <laughs> in terms of motivating, but also inspiring in terms of um, sort of clarifying misconceptions about politics and theology that, that we have when one uh, has to deal with one's uh, fellow citizens uh, right, uh, uh, one sort of realizes the messiness and complexity of, of life and when one deals with uh, the powers that be, right, whether they're corporations or universities or uh, just really bad rich people, right, uh, one sort of sees uh, all the nasty things that, that those powers are willing to do in order to get their way uh, and uh, more enchantments and mystifications fall away. So I've really been inspired by Melissa Snar's work, for example, looking at living wage campaigns and, and sort of a Christian involvement in living wage campaigns uh, as uh, doing the work of ethical formation, right? That uh, in the, the process of the campaign, uh, which she looks at through ethnographic work, you can see the, the virtues forming, right? Uh, and sort of the mystifications falling away, uh, right? And that seems helpful for me, um, you know, in this sort of grander scale of, of, of uh, politics, right? So, so not just at the ethical level, but also at the political level, and not just uh, in living wage campaigns, but you know, in the whole uh, palette of uh, new social movements that are you know from Occupy Wall Street to Black Lives Matter to uh, Standing Rock, right? There, there's a um, the, this sort of uh, revival of activism that that is so inspiring. That's a, a great place to, to look for it for that kind of messiness. about
sovereignty and how like there's this kind of uh maybe this idea of sovereignty that is not necessarily realistic the theorists don't necessarily get what's going on on the, on the ground so i'm wondering if maybe we can understand sovereignty under the rubric of Michel Foucault's notions of power and how power is not just something that's like displaced from me from me or from you and kind of um imposed upon us from the outside but it's actually something that kind of is embedded with us from the inside too right so it shapes our desires it shapes our policing of ourselves it shapes us as as beings who are not only surveilled but who surveil other beings and so how could like how, maybe we can understand power in that way so how would how would the politics of the middle um address like this kind of Foucault, Foucaultian notion of of surveillance or microphysics of power yeah the, it's a, a, an interesting question so i, I mean I, while you know Foucault is really helpful in thinking about uh historical change and about giving us tools for um, seeing that the conceptual uh, vocabularies that we have, that, that we're working with now uh, are not necessary. They can be radically different. I do worry that uh, particularly around uh, questions of uh, the circulation of power uh, and the way that power sort of can um, go from the inside out and each uh, sort of constitu be, become constitutive of, of each soul Right, uh, in, in modernity or late modernity, what uh, makes us human and you know, the Christian vision of the soul is, uh, can be lost, right? So uh, I mean, I, I, I tend to think that ideology and um, power circulating through ideology uh, never goes all the way down, right? Those who are most invested in it are those who are um, closest to privilege, have the most privilege, right? Uh, and those who are the, uh, you know, at a distance from privilege, who are marginalized, uh, uh, even if uh, they are partially constituted by, you know, ideology and power, right, they're never fully constituted by ideology and power. And looking at that remainder, right, which is uh, our humanity, right, the, the, the bit of us, <laughs> which uh, is worldly terms, right, uh, or the soul, right, is another name for it, right. Um, now, that seems like the most important uh, thing to look at, and, and that's why there, I would talk about an epistemic privilege of the oppressed, right, or an epistemic privilege of the marginalized, right? Those who have the best insights into our humanity and into theology are those who are the most dominated or oppressed because it's uh, so obvious to them that you know, ideology is not exhaustive of the human condition. It seems to me that that would um, cohere with uh, a lot of liberation theology, right? So you have like these very strands of liberation theologies. Why do you think that Christian theology has um, the tool, has a tool or some tools in its kind of like theoretical or practical um, tool belt that can resist ideology or, this, or these ideas of power that kind of ideologies of power that do not always go all the way down into people's souls? Like, it, it, I mean, is there something within Christianity that we can use as resources as, for tools of resistance? Uh, on the one hand, uh, I mean, the easy answer is that we're living in a world, you know, all of us, uh, uh, as, uh, you know, all of us are living in a world constituted by Christianity, just as we're living in a world constituted by American popular culture, you know, whatever corner of the road we're in these days, and by, you know, technology, I mean, there, there are sort of a set of things that are unavoidable, of which Christianity is one, even if it's not as often uh, spoken as one, even if it's not as often sort of seen as part of a sort of cultural imperialism, you know, uh, whatever corner of the road you're in, um, uh, a set of Christian ideas about, you know, even if they're secularized Christian ideas about love, <laughs> right, the, the Beatles are singing, right, they're, they're still, you know, part of, uh, you know, how we see, how everyone sort of sees the world. Um, so that means that the, the tools of uh, Christianity are, um, uh, you know, uh, at hand, you know, uh, and, uh, and potentially useful uh, globally um, for thinking about and responding to uh, problems of injustice and, and domination, but that is just a sort of easy answer that Christianity is everywhere, so it's an easy thing to use. Uh, another and maybe better answer is that the Christian tradition has been thinking for a long time about how the ways of the world uh, have gone uh, awry, right? How there are uh, powers and principalities that are trying to uh, do all sorts of uh, nasty things to people and to communities uh, and uh, obscure through, you know, idols, the way that people see each other, see their themselves, see their communities. Uh, and the Christian tradition has been responding to this, this diagnosis for decades and centuries and millennia now. 
uh, and developing uh, toolkits uh, to, to, to do that. Obviously, the Christian tradition itself uh, goes wrong in many ways at many times uh, and is not immune from the very same problems that it's diagnosing and trying to correct out, uh, you know, in the world outside of itself. Uh, and the Christian tradition go to, goes wrong in really deeply problematic ways around race and gender and, uh, and class and elitism and, you know, all sorts of other things. Uh, and yet, right, that vision of imagining a world uh, radically other from the world we have, abolishing uh, systems of domination, living a life that is oriented away from ideology, right, away from idols, you know, those all seem like um, imperatives that are, are really important to, to capture. How does a non-supersessionist political logic then inform how you see Christianity and how Christianity's role within like dismantling systems of ideology and forms of oppression? Can those two things fit together? How, how do they fit together in your kind of construction? In the case of The Problem with Grace, uh, this book, I, I tried to uh, think with a few uh, sort of handful of uh, Christian categories, uh, love, uh, faith, uh, hope, liturgy, uh, tradition, and a few others, and say, you know, when we start with this uh, sort of Christian grammar, right, and appreciate the, those Christian imperatives of uh, turning away from ideology, right, turning away from the ways of the world, how can we look at these as practices, love or faith uh, or tradition or liturgy, as practices that encourage us to uh, turn away from uh, ideology, turn toward uh, a world that's radically otherwise. And, you know, it has to be, uh, the analysis has to be uh, uh, rather subtle because there are so many temptations <laughs> to read uh, this Christian vocabulary in ways that, that pull us back down into the world in ways that are contaminated by ideology. So, you know, part of the, the project of this book was to, you know, just think carefully with his Christian grammar to name those temptations and uh, show examples of people like James Baldwin, Simone Weil, Franz Kafka that are, that are thinking otherwise, whether they call themselves uh, Christian or not, uh, there's a, a sort of Christian grammar at work and um, an imperative to, to think otherwise. I was actually going to bring up Baldwin uh, because I'm working with, I just wrote a master's thesis on Baldwin. I'm defending it uh, this coming Thursday on how I'm arguing that though he may not be a theologian per se, um, I'm, I'm making the case that his, his thematics and his grammar, as you would say, mm -hmm. or his basically his critique of racism and systemic racism and the oppression that comes with such, it actually marks him within the uh, liberation theology tradition. So I'm, I'm arguing that he's, liberation, he's within that tradition, even if he necessarily didn't, or didn't necessarily identify himself within that tradition. So that's really interesting to me because, I mean, I remember you, you interacted with Baldwin quite a bit in this book, and um, I don't have any particular quotes, but I'm wondering why or what it is from Baldwin that you use or you are interested in in terms of addressing the politics of the middle and this non um problem with grace. Thanks, and congratulations on finishing up your, your thesis there. Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm moving forward in the... Uh, studies and, and for choosing a topic that is so uh, timely and, uh, and important, uh, thinking about Baldwin in, in terms of uh, his uh, Christian background and the resources that it has for, for today and, and connections with liberation theology. And it, it, in this pr uh, particular project in the, in the Problem with Grace, I was thinking about Baldwin as uh, someone who, uh, through the care he takes in his writing and, and thinking, right, avoids uh, this supersessionist logic, avoids uh, sort of opposition between uh, law and grace, which you know he saw in his uh, father, in the sort of church communities that he left, right? and yet he retains uh, a kind of spirit and uh, Christian formation, right, that orients him away from ideology, away from idols, away from the ways of the world, uh, even while sort of engaging with and, and grappling with the, the tensions that. That, that are in the world and the, the complexities uh, of the world. Um, more recently, I've been thinking about Baldwin in terms of negative theology, right? In terms of uh, Baldwin as someone who is always telling us what God is not, right? Uh, and warning us against uh, idolatry. So whether it's uh, in terms of uh, fathers or in terms of political temptations, you know, political programs that would promise to give us all the answers uh, Baldwin is uh, sort of telling us that, you know, these are to be avoided. These are just pretend gods, uh, little gods, uh, and we need to 
be committed to something else, even if he, in his uh, later life after he leaves uh, the church, doesn't fill out uh, in, a, in a Christian way what that positive vision would be. And that's making sense so much of what I've read um, of Baldwin in the last couple of years. He doesn't necessarily prescribe, like you're saying, uh, a particular vision of the world, but he does have a critique of the world, a very strong and very poignant critique that can address our world today, because, I mean, he's still very much a part of our modern American landscape. We've talked a little bit about law and grace. Maybe you can just give a brief outline of what law is and what grace is. I think that grace, especially within Christian parlance, gets gets Trump's law, right? This very this very stilted version of law where law is just a pure obedience. Um, Israel is just a, as a nation that's based on pure obedience with no grace. So maybe you can g- maybe give a brief outline of what law and grace generally means and, like, and then how you're using it. So, I mean, as you're saying, there can be sort of a caricature of law as a kind of rote obedience, uh, just taking a set of rules and doing exactly what uh, they say, right? And seeing that as um, the way, the path to happiness or salvation or uh, whatever it is, is just following, even excessively following every detail of a set of, a set of rules, sort of caricatures of the Pharisees. Right, uh, in the Bible can evoke those sorts of images. But, uh, right, I, I mean, w- w- what uh, I want to think, th- the direction I want to take that uh, is to think even more expansively about laws as, you know, systems of, uh, sort of networks of concepts, uh, right, that, that allow us to think we can fully explain aspects of the world, right? I mean, in a sense, uh, you know, science is about law, right, about giving an account of the world but also you know, parts of analytic philosophy that think that you know, we can provide all the necessary and sufficient conditions to understand a certain concept or the social sciences or you know, how um, you know, sort of intuitions about how we ought to start our work by providing the definitions. And then once we get the def- definitions right, we can build from that, right? Which you know, in high school essays, uh, maybe is uh, how, how people are, are taught to, to think about things. So this sort of aspiration to provide a, an exhaustive account of the world, I, I want to think about as, as an instinct toward law. And then, uh, you know, uh, grace uh, as going in the opposite uh, direction, right? Saying that, you know, those who, uh, yeah, in a, in a contrastive mode, right? So those who come before have uh, been so focused on you know, uh, following the rules, so, so focused on explaining all of the uh, atoms that they've left, they've lost a spiritual dimension of science or something like that. Uh, these uh, uh, sort of popular uh, science and spirituality and new age uh, texts have, have a kind of grace that they advertise, right? Uh, that just by thinking beyond the material or beyond the uh, rule following aspects of the world, we'll, we'll, we'll get things things right. And, you know, I want to argue that these, these two things uh, seem like they're different, but they're actually the same, right, or actually, you know, uh, come from the same root, right? They're, they're both ignoring you know, how most people actually live their lives, which is, uh, you know, in, in, in the messiness, right, in the middle, right, uh, between uh, a sense of rule following and a sense of uh, complete redemption or, or complete salvation. Uh, and that, that space of the middle uh, as difficult, right? Not, not, a diff- not a middle in which we can just find rest or peace, but a, a mid- middle which is always uh, always characterized by tumult and uh, difficulty and so on. Now, that's what we should um, uh, be embracing. Why do you think the middle is so messy? Why do you think human life is so difficult? You know, I mean, there are times of high, you know, we, we, of high blessedness or whatever, where we feel like we're elated, moments of joy, moments of, of extreme ecstatic, you know, love or, or just going to a great concert or, you know, having a great plate of food. I mean, I mean, I mean, even just mentioning those things, like him having a great plate of food can be something that's completely ordinary, but why is, why do you think life is so messy and, and what does that form? Like, how does that form a bedrock for understanding how we should interact with each other on a political level? I mean, in a sense, uh, you know, the world has fallen, right? There, there <laughs> are systems of domination, right? There, there are, you know, ideologies which are, you know, purporting to explain things, but really just advancing the interests of the few, Right, uh, so all of these things make the world messy. But you know, uh, just um, what it means to be human right, uh, is to uh, be incapable of understanding everything. Right, to to be nice, right? to be uh, struggling with uh, understanding ourselves and the people around us, uh, and 
know, what it means to be who we are. Right? Uh, what we are is not who we are, and that question of who we are is one that we're continually throughout our lives uh, struggling with. These are all sort of forms of the, the, that messiness takes. Uh, and, you know, what are the political, what's the political relevance of this? Uh, well, on the one hand, you know, a politics uh, sometimes is described as um, a choice between realism and idealism. Right? Either, you know, you have this vision of the, of the uh, world that you try and implement in, in your political program, or, you know, you just sort of try and make everything a little bit better here or there. And, you know, I, I want to say that, you know, both of these get it wrong, right? Uh, that to do politics well, uh, we do have to be attentive to the specifics of the uh, social world and the facts uh, on the ground and the circumstances and who has power and all these sorts of things. But we also have to uh, be able to envision a world that's radically otherwise, right? Uh, a world without prisons, say, or a world where healthcare is guaranteed for everyone, right? All, all these should be uh, part of, you know, what animates our, our politics. Um, but we're always sort of tempted back to the realism or the idealism. So how do we strike that balance? Well, reflecting on our, our own lives where... You know, we have ideals. We want to figure out who we are, right? But we also have to uh, figure out what we're going to make for breakfast, right? Uh, we, we can uh, see, we can get practice in making that balance between realism and idealism at the personal or ethical level, and then take take that practice that we get into the into the. Particular. I'm interested in, in what you're just saying in terms of how the racial landscape can can be very messy, <laughs> to say the least, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to understate that, right? How are you configuring, like, you know, um, uh, a theorization and a, and a practicality of race within, like, this, this between moment between the ideal and the, and the real, right, where we all inhabit, we all live in the in space between idealism and realism on a daily basis? How would you square that up with uh, our thinking and interactions along the lines of race? And how does that, you know, and how does political theology with a really a critical racial theory critique or in, um, informed life actually um, change or, or bring about new things within political theology? Mm -hmm. I have been thinking uh, much more about race uh, uh, as a sort of central uh, category in, in political theology since, since working on the, the problem with race. So it's a, a helpful opportunity to revisit uh, and reflect on the, the connections uh, there between earlier work and the more recent uh, work I've been uh, doing. Right, so uh, on the one hand, race is, uh, uh, or racialization is just a system of domination, right, an ideology like uh, many ideologies, like patriarchy, uh, and like nationalisms, uh, like homophobia and so on, right, that um, distort, right, how we see the world, uh, that um, uh, rely on or, um, uh, you know, help us um, uh, uh, make us invested in supersessionist logics and rely on those supersessionist uh, logics. Um, so, uh, you know, on the one hand, you know, a race is just one more of these ideologies to oppose and that, you know, focusing on these sorts of practices of the middle uh, um, and, you know, articulating them rightly, whether it's tradition, liturgy, sanctity, revelation, prophecy, or whatever, can help us uh, think differently than uh, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, right? More recently, I've, I have been trying to think about this uh, epistemic privilege of the oppressed, right? How those at, uh, at the margins right, um, uh, can provide particular insight into uh, politics, philosophy, ethics, <laughs> theology, right? Um, uh, and how they can be doing intellectual work and not just the sort of object of intellectual work in our context of 21st century uh, America, right? where uh, the problem of anti-Black racism is still uh, a huge one and uh, in order of magnitude more significant than uh, many other sort of social problems that get discussed, not just one on the list of social problems, but you know, a sort of uh, much deeper and broader social problem. Um, you know, in that context, sort of listening to uh, Black American political and religious thinkers and seeing how they connect critiques of ideology, both around race, but also around other issues with grassroots organizing uh, has been really sort of inspiring for me and uh, has uh, made me think that, you know, this is a sort of technique that political theology as a field or as a practice ought to really um, embrace, right? listening to the um, marginalized voices who are doing uh, organizing work, who are speaking in 
uh, sometimes explicitly theological, sometimes only implicitly theological idioms, right? Those are sites where the most fruitful political theological reflection can, can occur. You know, Baldwin was a writer, right? And so, but he also spent time in the South. I mean, he, he lived in France for a while. And I mean, he lived in France on and off for, I think, for the most majority of his life after, in the, I think he left in the 40s and then just lived there for a while. But, um, but he also visited the South and got involved in the struggle and, and wanted to write about people, live daily, you know, people who are living day to day in, in, in the middle of the struggle, right? So this idea that, like, the marginalized voices are not something to be studied as, as objects, but are subjects who have their own voices, I found really fascinating in your conversation. I mean, it seems just so commonsensical today, maybe to some people, that uh, marginalized voices are actually voices and they have something to say to our discourses. Um, and, and I don't mean our discourses as in like the, the privileged discourses, the privileged person's discourses, but our discourses as human beings and to enlighten us about um, a particular perspective on the world that doesn't get seen like in, that, in the university system, for, for instance, or in media, like uh, mainstream, me uh, not mainstream media, but like, you know, bigger media companies or outlets or just a common discourse. I, I'm, I'm really interested in this idea of epistemic privilege that you're talking about, but like, how does that, like, do you have to be in a position of, of, of like institutional privilege to be able to like bring those marginalized voices to the fore? I mean, in terms of like changing the discourse at like the, the, the privileged institutions or do you have, or do you just, how do you shed light on people's voices that are not being heard? Right. So, mm -hmm. uh, especially within racial discourses, but with any, any kind of marginalized discourse in that sense. I mean, I, I think one of the things that this uh, sort of uh, focus on the, the broken middle, uh, to use Jillian Rose's phrase, uh, uh, helps us do is, you know, not just take uh, marginalized voices as uh, authorities, right? Uh, or as guides, right? That's too easy, in a sense. So uh, even uh, in various forms of marginalized communities, right? Ideology is at work, right? Yes. People are confused about themselves. People are still looking for themselves and trying to figure out who they are and, and how uh, their communities can, can, can flourish. And so seeing uh, the, the broken middle, right? The, the, the complexities and di difficulties and fragmentations of the world operating everywhere, right? In, in, in privileged spaces and in marginalized spaces, uh, is the sort of prerequisite to engaging, you know, with any uh, any sort of uh, uh, community or or, or 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 context. I like James Baldwin, but James Baldwin gets some things wrong, right? He romanticizes love in some ways that I, you know, I, I think Audre Lorde pushes uh, beyond, right? Just to take one uh, one example uh, there, uh, if we want love and justice to to work together in, in fruitful, uh, fruitful fruitful ways. But I mean, in terms of engaging with marginalized communities and voices, right? So I mean, on the one hand, every community has centers and margins, right? And there's a, a need to avoid exoticizing. Right? So when there are marginalized perspectives in one's own sort of circle, looking at you know a, a distant other, right, and then holding that up can be can be problematic, right? Uh, <laughs> So I mean, it, it, uh, it seems like there's some ethical work involved in attending to uh, the ways that, you know, those around us and even we ourselves in certain aspects of our own, you know, lives and formations have, you know, experienced domination and uh, forms of marginalization. But, you know, things happen at different scales and at different magnitudes. Uh, so attending to, to that complexity seems important. But I mean, I, I think most of all, sort of, uh, you know, engaging with texts and practices as we would, you know, from other spaces as we would engage with our own, right? Which means critically, right? Taking what works, uh, seeing where there are deformations, even while we're sort of acknowledging the prima facie epistemic privilege of the oppressed, like on the, on the surface of it, right? Uh, there, we should, uh, there are insights in marginalized communities. Um, that doesn't mean that we don't get some things better, you know, we can't see some things more accurately than people in marginalized communities can, right? So the, the, there, there's a, a, a difficult kind of engagement that, that's, that's necessary, no sort of easy way forward on that. Yeah, I suppose that the, that would be a supersessionist logic there too, where you're privileging the un, underprivileged as having everything right and having everything figured out. And that would not, that would go against kind of this politics of the middle, which you're arguing for. Instead of having this polarity between the two, which you kind of have a divide there, right? There, maybe the con conversations between the critiques and the, and the counter critiques might be more fruitful than just simply saying, um, no, we need to put this one or the, or the other one, because we can still get into this logic of, of, of privilege there. So you mentioned, and uh, I think it was in 
the uh, the afterword of the problem of grace, where um, or the appendix, sorry. And you argued for a political philosophy as as making visible the invisible, in contrast to or or in light of political science and political theory. I, I'm wondering um, what you're doing with the contrast there. It seems to me that political science and political theory are on one side, and political philosophy is something else is happening underneath. So I'm wondering if you can elaborate a little bit more upon the the, the what you're working on there in that chapter. Mm-hmm. I'm wary of getting sort of caught up in uh, terminological and sort of specific institutional formations, right, which um, in the big scheme of things don't matter that much, right, uh, what one calls X or Y or Z or, you know, who happens to be studying this or that. I mean, on the other hand, um, when, uh, you know, uh, particular institutional formations do matter, right, because they can control the conversation and they can legitimate or delegitimate particular sorts of um, ethical and political engagement. So, I mean, in this um, uh, chapter, right, I'm uh, worried a- a- about uh, the way that um, uh, secular, some secular disciplines uh, can present themselves with such confidence <laughs> that they uh, seem to answer all of the questions or have the capacity to answer all of the questions, uh, even if, <laughs> you know, their mode of answering all of the questions is uh, one that uh, purports humility or something like that, right? Uh, even if it seems as if, you know, uh, their ethics is just to be receptive and engaged with the world or something like that, that's still, you know, giving you an answer to all of the questions, right? And in contrast, political uh, theology, or at least the instinct between political theology, behind political theology, uh, I want to say here, you know, um, is always reminding us of the invisible, right? Always reminding us that there are, uh, things that we're, we can never see, but they can interrupt our world. Uh, and we should be attending to those and figuring out how to study and write uh, and see the world in a way that allows ourselves to be open to those interruptions. So when we quantify and, and we, and we um, measure and we go out and we take polls, we're, we're measuring data, but at the same time, we're not really measuring our assumptions about how we're for, forming or shaping or structuring the, the data that we're measuring, right? So like, we have these political or philosophical assumptions that are that are invisible to us that I think that you were arguing that political theology or political philosophy can actually make visible for us to help us see better, to help us see like how we're framing and structuring the world itself. So, I mean, in a sense, you're arguing for for theory. And, and theory, and I, I, mean, I don't want to get into the politics of theory versus practice or politics of theory versus data or whatever. So what are you working on now? You're talking about a little bit about how you're doing more work on race, political theology, but um, are you doing anything in your sabbatical time? Besides yeah, so, being a parent and then and a <laughs> husband and all that? <laughs> yes, I, I've been uh, thinking about the political theological, vocab- uh, political theological vocabulary of uh, racial justice movements. Um, so uh, after the problem with grace, I, I, I thought about uh, natural law and appeals to God's law or higher law in African-American political thought and sort of seeing that as a, as a way to do political theology from the margins, uh, as it were. Uh, and noticing how, you know, Frederick Douglass, Anna, Anna Julia Cooper, um, Du Bois, Martin Luther King, all used, uh, you know, all appealed to God's law or a higher law in a way that was um, not just rhetorical, but sort of essential to their um, uh, political and really political theological uh, positions um, at the level of um, ideas and at the level of practice and organizing and activism. But then that sort of died away, right? People don't, it's not a part of the sort of, uh, black uh, political vocabulary now. And in, in the book, Black Natural Lie, I give an account of why I think that is. And uh, in some ways, you know, um, just because of the success of um, the civil rights movement in integrating social uh, and educational spaces, black elites go into white, uh, historically white institutions and some of the organic grassrootsy vocabulary and political theology uh, no longer uh, is visible or, or gets a, a public hearing. But uh, I noticed uh, that the language of dignity does circulate uh, very much uh, in Black political spaces and Black Lives Matter associated social media spaces <laughs> today. Uh, and dignity itself is, you know, even though it may sound secular, a uh, political theological concept, uh, one that, you know, moved from, you know, in the, in the 20th century, moved from Catholic spaces into international human rights law and the United Nations. But I want to think about how the way that dignity, as it's been part of the black political tradition and continues to be part of the black tr- political tradition, 
is a bit different than the dignity that is described by the United Nations or that is you know, part of the inherent uh, worth of every uh, human being or derived from that inherent worth. Right? That dignity um, is achieved through struggle against domination in the black political tradition, I want to say. And uh, taking dignity as a starting point, we can uh, start, uh, we can make sense of the vocabulary, the new moral vocabulary, new moral vocabulary that's uh, circulating in racial justice social media spaces. So abolitionism, black love, uh, black rage, you know, a, a, a language that uh, wasn't there five years ago, but is there today. Now, uh, how can we think about all that language as exemplifying black dignity as a political theological project? Dignity is a word that's used in uh, many different ways. And uh, uh, even in the sort of, uh, European intellectual tradition, right, the word shifts dramatically from being something that's ascribed to aristocracy, right? Like uh, the dignity of bishops or kings uh, or judges to something that is democratized and is ascribed to each human being, right? Uh, sort of characteristic of the human uh, person. Uh, human dignity is just a concept that's uh, like a phrase that's uh, invented in the uh, 20th uh, century. But in contrast to that narrative of democratization from dignity as an aristocratic concept to dignity as a democratic concept, uh, I want to think about the indignity, right, that uh, comes about by being uh, fully constituted by ideology, right? There, there's something about how, uh, when one is just doing what ideology has one do, right? Uh, there's no dignity there, right? But when one is realizing one's humanity, right? That remainder of oneself that is not formed by ideology, that's where we find dignity. Uh, and that's where we find struggle, right? That's where we find something that cannot be assimilated into ideology. And so is, you know, opposed to ideology, whether it's in music aesthetically, whether it's in literature and writing, right, in, in the prose of James Baldwin, or uh, whether it's theologically, right? Um, these are all sites where uh, I think we can find humanity and dignity uh, and that the black political tradition can help us, help us notice. So that brings us full circle, full circle back to political th theology as a resistance to imperialism or ideology. So, hey, well, thanks for coming on. I appreciate your dealing with my canceling on you twice and uh, uh, all of all of those idiosyncrasies that I bring to the table. Great. Well, thank you so much. I enjoyed talking, and best of luck with your defense. Yeah, yeah. It's just defense. It's just a master's thesis defense. And it's on uh, this coming Thursday, so it's my birthday too. So hopefully, I do well. <laughs> Great. Yeah. All right, Vincent. Have a good day, man. Yeah, you too. Bye. Bye.